I've been on retreat uh, and vacation for the last two weeks. And for me, formally, it's not over until uh, 8 o'clock Monday morning. So <laughs> uh, wearing my uh, retreat shawl, my retreat zen. Uh, when people go on long retreat, um, particularly solo retreat, um, a lot of times they're just wearing a, a plain um, shawl like this, so not identifying as any particular um, monastery or um, group. And uh, they let all their hair grow and uh, sometimes uh, don't bathe. Uh, that's very effective if you want to do a solo retreat. <laughs> And see pull away. <laughs> I wasn't totally doing a solo retreat <laughs> like that. So, <clears throat> um, when I was studying with um, Chodron Rinpoche, uh, you know, we were talking about what um, what kind of uh, robes or things should be appropriate for um, people at Lions or who weren't weren't monastics, but not you know, just householders either. So we kind of came up with um, wearing uh, a shawl like on retreat, like Milarepa, right? <clears throat> but there are other, there are other kinds of uh, shawls too with sometimes uh, maroon uh, stripes and um, more white than maroon, but generally, generally just ordained people are just wearing pure maroon and uh, white definitely all, always like a uh, householder has, uh, or yogi has a tassel like that. So, I don't know. This is from India and Tibet, of course. <clears throat> so today talking about retreat. So um, of course this retreat where we leave and we go somewhere and um, by ourselves, sit uh, somewhere outside or inside or with others. But I'd also like to talk about our our daily retreat. Um, if you want to do um, profound practice, it's best to think you're actually on retreat um, all the time. <laughs> so particularly if we're doing Tantra Vajjana so that we don't totally um, buy into what we call as ordinary perceptions. Ordinary perceptions is I'm, I'm just here in Sacramento and doing my job or school and I have a cat or I have a relationship and then I, you know, then I do this. We, we are doing all that, but that isn't the whole story. So when we're on retreat, internally or externally, uh, we're still, um, taking care of uh, tasks, but um, from a profound viewpoint. So uh, that's why I say, if you can maintain the view, we say the view is um, seeing things as they are. If you can maintain that, like I'm on retreat, in other words, I'm not being fooled or totally uh, thinking ordinary reality is all there is, then you could say you're on retreat all the time. Like that. <laughs> If we're thinking dualistically, you're thinking I'm an ordinary day-to-day uh, -day dharma practice and I can't wait to go on retreat and get away from it all, then that, that would be dualistic thinking, right? Like I just want to escape. <clears throat> we all have dualistic thinking, but we don't have to believe it all the time, right? <laughs> So uh, it, would, it, it would be quite a claim to say, I never have any dualistic or idiotic thoughts. It's even a big claim to say, I, I don't I believe uh, every idiotic thought I have, right? Or even bigger, I don't believe every thought I have. <laughs> so I want to talk today about what, uh, you know, I, a retreat would look like um, somewhat a uh, drawing from uh, a Westerner, Joseph Campbell, who talked about the hero's journey, and also um, drawing 
uh, from teachings I received from uh, um, Namkai Narba Rimshe uh, from the cycle of day and night. <clears throat> I have called these Sunday workshops, um, Sunday talks, the Shambhala journey, <clears throat> um, because uh, I've added a few things to uh, uh, Joseph Campbell's her hero's journey. <clears throat> and the typical hero journey, um, uh, the hero and heroine go through um, all kinds of changes and um, transformations. They leave the known world and go into the unknown world. They gather um, aids and guides to deal with obstacles. They um, have some kind of sacred union at the uh, center of the journey, either with themselves or God or um, a relationship. And then uh, they can't or don't maintain that situation, but then uh, flee or leave it and come back to ordinary reality. Um, and also have problems coming back, but that they, the idea is that they basically bring back uh, some wisdom or knowledge that they've gained or stolen, <laughs> like the golden fleece or something. And uh, then they bring that back and um, are celebrated by the community and um, communities enriched, right? So that's um, a good story, right? We'd like that, yeah. However, inner teachings, um, particularly Shambhala teachings, um, are uh, add a little bit. So uh, after uh, an experience of union and then flight from union return um, to known world, uh, yes, we're bringing gifts back for ourselves, for the community, our relationship, but um, the transformation is not done there. Um, at some point, um, we become betrayed uh, either by ourselves or by um, people we're close to, and then um, we're uh, disgraced. And then at the go through a process of being disgraced, and then uh, eventually uh, we go through a process of being forgotten. And it is that point of uh, betrayal, disgrace, and forgotten, uh, then uh, it, it does kind of end um, uh, interestingly. Um, then it's possible we go through that process of betrayal and um, uh, disgrace. And um, it is possible then to manifest Jalu, the rainbow body. So when I say Jalu, a rainbow body, um, I've talked about that a couple of weeks ago or last month, did I? Yeah, something. So um, we, we think that's something to, that, that's kind of like the dessert <laughs> after we've been good boy, good girl. Um, but um, uh, my teacher, who knew a little bit about Christianity used to say, uh, if you want to be resurrected, you have to be crucified first. And um, generally students don't want to go through that. We want to skip the betrayal, the disgrace, and the forgotten phase, and you know, just get the uh, rainbow body phase, right? <laughs> Are you willing to be, um, you know, betrayed and, you know, criticized and then disgraced and and people don't even want to remember your name. So sometimes once in a while people ask, oh, when when do I get to be a llama? You know, I'd like to be a llama too. And I said, are you, are, are you willing for people to criticize you? We go, well, not really. Well, then maybe a little bit. <laughs> Are you willing to be betrayed and disgraced? Are you willing to be forgotten? Mm -hmm. So some kind of Zen con that, that I give to people is say, would it be okay 
what would it be like if you become enlightened and, and nobody notices that anything at all has changed? Would that be okay? <laughs> you do all this practice and get all this and then people go, well, you know, I just look like you. <laughs> would that be okay? <laughs> Of course, in a small way, fast way, the, the Buddha went through the same experience, right? So I uh, had to deal with the doubts before, the maras of the doubts before his uh, awakening, and then even some doubts afterwards, walking around Bodh Gaya for 49 days, he thought, well, maybe or 40 days, maybe people wouldn't be open to this teaching. It's so simple and profound. Maybe I'll just stay in the jungle. But Indra came and said, you know, maybe, maybe a few of your people could get it. So we went to the deer park. But when he approached his, uh, his other uh, friends, thought he was like, they felt he had betrayed them, right? It's very, told very quickly in the biographies, right? Very, you know, still quite like, you know, he thought about things and then he walked to Bodh Gaya and then they saw him and then he won them over real quickly. I doubt if it happened that quickly. Seriously, real world, I doubt if it happened that quickly. They probably went, you know, um, we saw you go over that tree and eat when we weren't eating and now you're back and I don't know. It probably took, you know, a long time, right? Probably took some time. And probably, you know, the Buddha had to like, oh, well, can't just walk back and say I'm enlightened. <laughs> I have to I have to connect, make some kind of relationship, right? So that's, he started teaching. So it wasn't just like, I show up, everyone sees something enlightened and then goes from there. You had to then um, kind of die to really disappear in some sense as looking like some kind of enlightened person and then come back to just kind of ordinary. Like, hey, let's just talk about, you know, let's tell the truth about how things suck, you know, truth is suffering, right? So he, went back to being like just kind of oh oh okay we'll listen to you now you're you're a siddhartha you know we know that and then gradually um they were able to see him uh you know as he taught and established a real relationship with him then they could see uh you know his rainbow body like that he could manifest that <clears throat> But we have to go through that stages um, of you feel really like, wow, I feel really enlightened. <laughs> and then um, something has to happen for us to really relate correctly and do a correct retreat. So um, there's a famous uh, story. <clears throat> um, a couple of people here have been hanging out with Zennies, so I can tell some Zen stories. Um, the well-known teacher Dogen from like 13th, 12th century Japan uh, went to China, where um, at the time that was seen as where the pure Dharma was, and um, studied for a long time, very intense practice. And um, uh, when he got back to, I think, his main temple of Eheji, um, where I've been, actually, um, you know, somebody asked, well, what, what did you attain, right? That's always a good question. Like, what'd you get out of your retreat? <laughs> so does anybody know, this? maybe this, um, maybe it could be true, maybe apocryphal, but what Dogen replied. No, it wasn't that. But you get you get a point for trying. So that's good. Yes. Well, that wasn't it, but you also get a point. People get points for just speaking up. You know, that's we have to do that. That's really important. 
<clears throat> so apparently he said, I realized that eyes are horizontal and the nose is vertical. Mm. Does it sound very Zen or is that just the truth? <clears throat> So uh, when we do a full journey, uh, you know, we uh, are able to uh, manifest the rainbow body um, and, uh, you know, physically across the rainbow body, um, in some cases, uh, people uh, actually dissolve into light and um, just their robes are left or fingernails or hair sometimes relics or ring soul or something <clears throat> but they're different uh kind of aspects of rainbow body so um the very profound aspect of rainbow body of course the buddha was able to manifest um uh there in bodh gaya was just um Eyes, eyes are horizontal, nose is vertical, you know, just uh, this very interesting level of uh, super ordinary reality, we call it. It's not the ordinary dualistic nose or ordinary dualistic eyes, um, but um, it's uh, still uh, ordinary mind with a big O. Somehow. So what's the difference between like, just when we say, well, okay, that's great. Yeah, eyes, horizontal <laughs> nose, vertical, and actually uh, saying it from the standpoint of uh, a rainbow body. Well, the standpoint of rainbow body from philosophic or insight level would be everything is completely related to everything and uh we are unable to objectify relationships at all absolutely we cannot do it that's absolute reality everything is in relationship and the relationships are non-objectifiable just like a rainbow so uh that's what's interesting about tantra and zen too is we lose we use uh, language which uh, appears to be objectifying, and yet because the subject is aware, uh, uh, the words are poetry instead of talking about objects. So when we say jalu or rainbow, we mean uh, someone is existing in the world uh, of complete, uh, absolute relationship where uh, nothing is being objectified. So interestingly, in Tantra and Zen too, so um, when you say, well, what's it like to be um, completely, what is complete non-objectifiable language? Um, it's pretty much the same way we just say, um, the sky is blue and the grass is green. Is that enough? Well, when we're in Jalu, that's enough. Yeah, it's just enough. Sky is blue, grass is green. Yeah. So none of none of reality is in conflict. It's all uh, in relationship, like a rainbow. Mm. So the the journey, the relationship journey. Um, uh, the retreat every day is we have this uh, ongoing relationship with ourselves and others and um it it starts out with leaving our ordinary world just like hero heroine would leave ordinary world either being called by circumstances or internal call and then accessing um problems and accessing uh guides and then having a uh, different experiences that culminate in uh, return uh, 
to the world in a new way, but uh, it's a 360 degree um, journey, much like um, coming back, uh, maybe uh, Dorothy coming back to Kansas <laughs> like that. <laughs> For you um, Wizard of Oz fans. So uh, it's coming back to um, seeing the what we think of as the ordinary world in a non-objectified way. So even though we talk of blue sky and grass green, um, it's not the blue that is the object blue, or it's not the grass that is the object grass, or it's not the eyes that the object eyes or the nose like that. It's the uh, lived experience green or blue, the lived experience, eyes or nose, like that. <clears throat> but in our tradition, and in authentic traditions, um, uh, somehow we have to go through that process of um, leaving and returning, um, but uh, returning and, and being uh, eventually uh, questioned, ignored, maybe disgraced and um if we hang in there then able to manifest a complete uh rainbow body like that so i wonder about you know sometimes uh you know disgraced teachers <laughs> who i've known a few you know so um I, I would like to be able to interview them maybe i'll get a chance so um uh, you know, what ha what happens when they have to just kind of, so like, an, I, I knew the Vajra regent Ursul Tenzin with um, Trungpa Rinpoche, who of course died of AIDS and then um, went through a process of disgrace and betrayal and abandonment and um, died in Ojai, uh, California back a long time. But it would have been interesting for me, you know, I'm thinking kind of Lama therapy style, like, well, how, how do you see yourself now? What, what's happened? To, what, what's it like now? And, you know, uh, it would be interesting. Same way with um, Sogi Ramshe built, you know, used um, Dharma Centers and um, wonderful book. Uh, what's the name of the book? Right, yeah. So um, he uh, ended up, you know, um, I think dying of cancer in Thailand, went to Thailand for treatment. But it, it would have been really interesting, like, well, how, how is it with you now? <laughs> so, you know, like um, most people go, I, I don't want to talk to somebody after they're betrayed and disgraced and they're ordinary again, you know, that like we don't want to talk to that person, right? Because there was a, picture of um Sogi Rimshe just wearing kind of householder clothes, right? You know. But that would have been really interesting for me. You know, so he he may have uh gained something. So I have no judgment. I don't know, you know, like, you know, maybe he did some horrible things, maybe he didn't, maybe he was betrayed by a Sangha it happens, right? Honestly. So um but it would have been interesting to interview him. Like, well, how do you feel right now? <laughs> What's going on? So I have that kind of sense of humor where, you know, if I was on, uh, you know, the mount and uh, um, Jesus, what what are you going, <laughs> how is it right now? You know, like that. <laughs> and, you know, what, what do you, what do you think? What, has it all been worth it? What, I, is the sky, is, is the sky blue and the grass is green? You know, what, what's going on with you like that? Do you guys ever think like that, you know? You know, because usually we don't want to talk to ourselves after we're, you know, kind of go through our own inner disgrace after we've beat up ourselves, abandoned ourselves, betrayed ourselves, you know, just kind of disappeared. Then we go, I, I don't want to talk to myself anymore. I'm just going to have a drink or get stoned or, you know, watch TV or something, you know. But what if we kind of kept talking to ourselves after we went through that journey? And we're kind of exhausted at the end of the day and go, hey, it's grass green. Is your nose vertical? What, what's it like? 
So maybe we can have, uh, if I haven't totally confused everybody, have some kind of conversation like that. <clears throat> you can ask questions. Greg, hi. Thank you. Uh, Lama, why is it bad to objectify something? <clears throat> that, that's a really good question. <clears throat> well, you mean bad like mistake or bad morally? Mistake. Yeah. Um, it, it creates a whole... Uh, pattern of um, mistakes with it. So uh, root objectification or root ignorance uh, doesn't self-correct itself. So you, you keep on kind of making the same mistake, just like addiction, you know, or doing the same thing over and over thinking we'll get a different result. So it's very frustrating. But okay, objectifying the sky is blue. Why? Why would that, or what would the consequences be? The consequences be when we think there's an outer world sky, then there must be an inner world subject that's solid experiencing the outer solid world. So things are always mimicking each other. So if we think the outer world is solid, then we have to create a solid inside world to, you know, to match it. Or we start with a solid inside world and then we demand a solid outside world. So things, the the process tends to freeze up. Good question. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lama. Hi. Um, my question is going to be about retreat, but I, I just wanted to mention uh, this morning I was listening to NPR and they were doing a, the subject was time and how we use our time. And there were two groups of people and to one group, they said, oh, this weekend, just do what you normally do, treat it like a regular weekend. The other group, they said, treat it like you're on vacation but they weren't going anywhere. They were saving wow. Um, And the group that treated it like a vacation, they did things just a little bit differently. They spent their time a little bit differently, but they still did some chores and usual things. But when they went back to work on Monday, that group that treated it like a vacation was much happier mm. than the group that didn't. So it made me think of that when you mentioned the retreat and doing a retreat at home because you're not actually on vacation you're doing it at home so uh, my question is how does one go about doing a retreat at home as opposed to going away for a retreat so going doing a retreat at home is the same essentially like we're leaving our ordinary reality and then we're returning with new eyes. So we have to go through this process of working with obstacles, gaining guides, uh, coming into um, uh, a sense of union, uh, and then, then the re returning to ordinary reality with new eyes, which, which entails uh, a stripping away experience. So there's a stripping away experience uh, to move from the known to the unknown world, right? Uh, and then there's a stripping away experience to return to the known, known world also. So our retreats like the full cycle of day and night. So ordinary reality is, um, you know, I, I just wanna feel better. <laughs> and have things work out, right? 
like I'm doing the retreat in order to, you know, be healthier and have things work out. And we're just starting from ordinary personal self, right? But there's also a motivation, bodhicitta, to um, clarify what that means, because you realize it's a conflict that goes with just believing in ordinary personal self. So we gather teachings, and then then we do go into non-ordinary reality or unknown world and uh, see things from a new perspective. But the new perspective has to be reintegrated into uh, the ordinary world. And then we have to return just like, you know, rocket or, you know, space capsule return to Earth and it all burns up, you know, on the way back. So the way we, we generally leave ordinary reality, um, even on whether you're in a cave or at home, is uh, we set up a schedule, okay, and do certain trainings that um, stir up um, the fixation to ordinary reality and, and open things up. And then usually, we're, even though we said, let's open up and you know, we're kind of surprised. We, we said, well, well, we'll open it up, but we didn't mean that much. So, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, we're, the idea of control is let go of in the uh, non-ordinary world. If you're still wanting to be in control, you cannot uh, attain union. <laughs> So, and then that union eventually, um, uh, you know, is still not a full union. You know, usually unions, like I feel, you know, people come back for a retreat, like I feel I on retreat, I was one with everything. I was just in the flow. Well, where are you now? Right? You're not in the flow now. So we know uh, it, it was a temporary state because it isn't that, that state of relative union is a temporary state. And then you have to come back. And that's you go through further trials that I'm characterizing as, you know, um, you, you come back and initially everyone thinks it's great, but then um, then the rug is pulled out from under you. And if you stay with that process, instead of just um, starting a new addictive process, then, then you will go through the stages and eventually come back to um, being able, you know, as we'd say, rainbow body. And then they'd say ordinary reality. <laughs> it's funny. <laughs> it's our, our way of talking. Because rainbows are quite ordinary, right? With amazing. Does that help? Oh, it does. Um, so is it kind of like uh, your mindset as you go into it? Kind of like in the study about you have the mindset that you're going to treat it like a vacation. So you have the mindset that you're going to uh, spend whatever days at home in a retreat, so you have your schedule. So your mindset is to be in that in that state rather than the ordinary, your everyday life. I wouldn't particularly call it vacation. Oh, no, no, I just yeah, meant but... similar to that study where those people had- Yeah, a little different. On vacation, right. but they came back, they carried some of that with them into their work right. week, which right. I imagine, I haven't been on retreat, <laughs> So <laughs> I imagine when you come out of it, at least in the beginning, you might feel a little bit different. But the on vacation, obviously, we, we always feel some buoyancy, right? Mm -hmm. That, you know, where we're, um, that would be a relative state. But um, the, you know, the, the energy of the retreat state, the momentum of the bodhicitta, the aspiration, um, to wake up for the benefit of all beings is the golden thread that allows us to go, um, you know, through this uh, further stripping process. Because we thought on the ascending side, you know, the arising side, we, we'd say in, in Tantra, the um, generation stage, right? Everyone likes generation stage. You know, good things are happening. You appear as deity. You know, everyone is happy, gets fed, you know, but we don't like the dissolution stage where things then are taken away from us, right? So uh, generally, um, you know, we, we in real retreat, we're going to go through both stages like that. So va vacation stage and vacation union uh, then has to, by necessity, um, 
uh, that samadhi has to be broken up. But um, normally we, we hold on to it a little bit and it does last for a little bit. And then, then we go back to feeling like, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. I have to use the microphone. Mm -hmm. Can you elaborate on the disillusionment stage and that experience? The disillusion and disillusion stage. <laughs> A little different, right? But I'm not sure which one you say, but yeah, generally every everything we're looking at. Um, and Dharma is we're beginning to see the process of uh, generation and the process of completion or the process of um, appearing and disappearing. This is human beings get us failed chimpanzees get uh, confused. Things appear and then they disappear like what gives and then they appear again like what happened. We're, we're confused about that. So we, we have to train to understand uh, how that works. And generally, we, we get attached to the um, uh, generation stage of the arising, right? We want things to keep arising. We want the, you know, the beer to keep <laughs> tasting good and not get, you know, drunk or something. So we have to go through a, um, uh, a letting go or um, a dissolution stage. Um, what is an example of something that might arise and disappear and how deep does that go? Like, does it, like, in how it, that applies to everything, like how, how deep does that actually go? It goes really deep. Everything, you know, a body arises and then gradually we're falling apart. Now my body is falling apart. I'm in dissolution stage. But good feelings arise, and we want them to continue, right? But they don't. And usually we, we have a problem with that. Yeah. So when, when we clarify the um, uh, appearing and disappearing um, process, then um, there's a, a real liberation. That's why we like talking about rainbows in our traditions, because uh, um, the rainbow, like rainbow body, is appears, but it is not solid. So it's the combination of what we call emptiness and appearance, union of the two truths. So that's why we like rain, talking rainbows. But uh, everything you, you physically we see here will disappear, right? So all phenomena that can be identified as phenomena will uh, disappear and reappear, you know, but we're, we're on retreat to clarify that process. Mm. What about truth? Like, is there stableness in truth? I mean, like capital T truth. So, uh, Hopefully, you know, we're going to stabilize that insight. So it usually starts out with some experience. And then if we investigate the experience, we'll gain an insight. If we stabilize the insight, we'll gain realization. If we put the realizations into our action and conduct, we'll have the truth. Yeah, like that. So, like... Yeah, so once we reach that capital T truth, then it would be stable. But that doesn't mean fixated, you know. It's it's still a dynamic process, don't you think? Yep. Good questions. Maybe one more. All right, our, our tech question, um, comment. Let's see. I'm trying to think of how to phrase it, but so, just to help with like, I guess my understanding is you're trying to, or is the aim to stabilize the flow and then integrate it with the ordinary? And then also if the flow... No. No. 
<laughs> I'll stop there. <laughs> or is it better to like be in that flow or is there a better? Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah so we, we want to be able to um, experience a sense of totality. The now the wisdom is the wisdom of totality. That's why we have the metaphor of a mandala and things express themselves as mandala, which is like everything's included and uh, it has its own totalistic pattern. So we we want that kind of uh, vision. So the vision includes appearing and disappearing, arising and falling, generating and completing. We, we want to be aware of the whole process as an integrated process. So we're not trying to, uh, you know, favor. So uh, in a sense, from uh, the ground level, to use kind of the Dzogchen term, uh, we're, we're actually not even biased towards nirvana or samsara. You know, even, even mistakes or fucked upness, to use Trungpa Rinpoche's term, um, you know, become part of the mandala. Otherwise, we're, we're kind of at war with um, how screwy things are. And then, then it becomes real spiritual materialism. We come, we, you know, we, uh, we start a war with the ignorance or ignorant people, and then, then we're back in dualistic thinking again. So we're, you know, uh, the all ground we'd say isn't biased. Right now, that's just a fantasy because we're generally biased, right? So um, a well-known teacher um, who's from Bhutan, um, Sangyar Kinsey Rimshe, <laughs> talks sometimes about the, uh, uh, you know, the, the eight worldly dharmas. Everyone wants gain and not loss. Everyone wants pleasure and not pain. Everyone wants praise and not blame. And everyone wants to be recognized and not ignored, right? So he's fun, you know, so he'll, he'll go, let's face it, I, 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 I want to be recognized and not ignored, you know, I, I'm not going to choose pain, right? You know, so uh, we, we have to be honest, you know, that it's, it's very difficult to be in that completely a non-biased place, right? So that's why, you know, there, there are some extraordinary individuals that, um, you know, people have recognized that are actually in that place, you know. That's, you know, so one of my teachers I said, please do not ever talk to me about, you know, like that you've attained, you know, one taste. We say in Mahamudra, it's like one taste. Then, then, then I'll have to put dog shit here and yogurt here, and then you'll have to close your eyes, then I'll switch them, and you won't care which one you eat. Are you ready for that? <laughs> you want to say one taste. That's not metaphorical. You'd have to go, oh, that's, that tastes really good. It's really hard to be non-biased, but we, we, can, we can see that, uh, that that is actually the nature of reality as it's non-biased. So that's why Harold, I, you know, tried to have a non-biased view towards our traditions like that. Hi. So uh, Dirk also had a question online. I don't know if um, should we do that one first? Okay, then we'll get we'll come back. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Dirk. Hi, Lana. Hi. You're looking rested. Thank you. Yeah, I feel. <laughs> Um, I just wanted to clarify that I understood what you were saying, because I believe that you were saying uh, two things. Uh, first, uh, uh, that you can treat every day as a retreat at home, right? Uh, which could be just your morning practice or your evening practice or whatever, right? But I think that you then step farther beyond that and and into considering even uh say the work day is a part of the re retreat is that correct yes yes okay yeah right thank you yeah you're welcome so um i'm very committed to um 
uh, what I you know call a Mahasiddha approach, which means that um, we we can continue with our ordinary ordinary jobs and relationships and do Dharma practice at the same time. Um, but uh, I have to add that we have to practice quite intensely, right? So <laughs> really, um, you can't say, well, I'm meditating 12 minutes a day and the rest of the time, I'm, you know, and then I'm paying attention and I'm doing intense Mahasiddha practice. You're not, you know, just honestly. I mean, we wouldn't say I'm practicing violin for 12 minutes and then I'll be playing a Karaniki Hall, right? So uh, to do a kind of approach where we see ourselves on retreat, even with work and relationships and, and still do, um, classic retreats, um, you, you really do have to practice like your head's on fire, like that. So, you know, um, this style of practice does uh, turn out uh, fairly intense individuals. Um, and um, hopefully my senior students are intense individuals and can tolerate other intense individuals, right? <laughs> that's always if you want to be intense individual you have to intolerate other intense individuals right you know so um uh and what's interesting about doing the practice is um the the more we practice from um uh the dissolution stage you could say the more appearance becomes more vivid right so rainbows are very vivid um so people that do um, deep training, their personalities are going to be very vivid, okay? They're, they're not going to be lukewarm. They're not going to be kind of blah. So um, all of us here have our personal personalities, right? And they're just going to become more vivid. That doesn't mean becoming more vivid doesn't mean they're going to be harmful, but like a rainbow, extremely bright and clarity is just shockingly bright. You know, so that's why we say the mind is naturally luminous. So you, you're just going to be more like you are, but you're not going to have the hard edges, you see. So you're going to be so totally clear, but, you know, we use the metaphor of you, somebody could walk right through you. Someone could put their hand right through you. So that's why we do the deity yoga to imagine ourselves as like rainbow body like that. So we're completely vivid, but at the same time, not um, all armored up solid, right? So we're not trying to do a flattening. Uh, some therapies and some forms of Buddhism try to kind of flatten you out a little bit. If, if you'd all just kind of you know, be more Presbyterian, be a better world. <laughs> Any Presbyterians in here, like, I can make Presbyterian jokes. So, you know, I just... <laughs> so here in Vajjana, we're, we're, we're vivid, uh, and we have, I don't, I don't know the science, we have either more watt or voltage, so we're high, we're high, but we won't, we won't um, kill you, right? We're intense, but we, we're not going to knock you over. It's just so vivid. It's like rainbow. When you get closer to, you know, rainbow, it kind of disappears. So when we treat a rainbow as an object, like we're kids, like mom, dad, please drive us to the rainbow, then, then it'll disappear. So we have to allow um, the vividness to stand on its own without solidifying it like that. But um, you do the more practice, people become more uh, who they are, not less who they are on a personal level. It's just that you don't have, you don't have the little burrs, you know, like metal work. If you have a little burr and it's little, you're running your hand to cut yourself, you don't have those burrs. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? A little bit. Yeah, good question. You were saying how reality is non-biased. Can you please kind of break that down a little more for me? Yeah, so we we say you know absolute ground reality is non-biased towards uh, mistake or can or or um, non-mistake. That's kind of scary because we want it to be biased, right? We want absolute nature to say it's always on the side of the good, 
and you know would never make a mistake or do anything but um uh we have to tell the truth that it uh the from uh the all ground um confusion rises even though the all ground itself does not um become confused <laughs> right okay thank you yeah earlier you related suffering to truth i was wondering if suffering was a truth and if it relates to nirvana and samsara samsara and how that's a good question so first truth is that we're, we're just going to tell the truth about um trauma and suffering and pain and messed upness we're just going to tell the truth about it that's first truth. So if we're, that's the first start to liberation is just recognizing and telling the truth of our actual lived situation like that. How does that tie into um, nirvana in samsara or does it? So, you know, when we're able to tell the truth consistently, that's nirvana. So, uh, when, when I was studying at Naropa University in Boulder, um, uh, all Tibetan style, I also started practicing Zen and um, invited uh, Sasaki Roshi to come and visit. Um, and uh, uh, the Lopan um, Westerner, Lodo Dor um, Dorji was super nice. And um, uh, and then also Reggie Ray came to meet him and they said, um, you know, what, what kind of dharma are you bringing and what, what do you have to say in the Zaki Roshi typical style? Just go, it's really cold in Boulder. And that was it. Thank you. Yeah. At the time, I didn't appreciate that. <laughs> I felt like these guys, you know, I was kind of, kind of like, I invited these luminaries from, you know, Trimpermshay scene, and all you can say is it's cold in Boulder, like that. Didn't appreciate that at the time. <laughs> yeah. So maybe we can end here. So we we'll get our, um, our chant master back. Dedication. Due to the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of the Guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception to that enlightened state. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow, and may that which has arisen not diminish but increase more and more. In the land encircled by snow mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good. All powerful Chen Rezing Tenzing Gyatso, please remain until samsara ends. May the teachings of the Buddha flourish, and may the upholders of the teachings remain forever. May all migrators achieve happiness, and may they fulfill all their temporary and ultimate goals. Low song, magical display at the deep awareness of all the victorious ones. Merciful giver of a stream of profound and vast instructions to the fortunate migrators. Please remain always unperishing, unchanging, unfading. Avalokiteshvara, great, great treasure of objectless compassion. Manjushri, master of law's wisdom. Vajrapani, destroyer of the entire host of Maras. Tsongkhapa, crown jewel of the snowy land sages. Lo Sangdrakpa, I make the request at your holy feet. Yeah, thank you. Very good. So um, the schedule today is um, maybe we have some snacks if people stay and, um, you know, leading Kala Chakra at two o'clock and everyone's invited to that. And then um, Salong Yoga at what, three, right? 
Mm. Buddhist yoga, like that. And uh, I'll, I'll hang out in the library office for a few minutes before lunch. Um, people want to say hi. Sound okay? Any other announcements? Yes, thank you. Thank you so much for that teaching today, first of all. Mm -hmm. uh, I was writing so much. I have to write. I don't remember enough on my own. But um, I just wanted to let people know that on Thursday, um, October 6th, Geshe Gendon, a very uh, longtime friend, is going to teach on this topic called the Eight Verses of Mind Training. And that's at 7 o'clock here. And then um, the other thing is that um, if you uh, if you're able to help us to, you know, help us with our mortgage and our utilities and things look, to keep this space open and going, then we so appreciate it. And there's a box at the front. So, so that, thanks, Patty. Thank yeah, classic is um, uh, <laughs> cl classic Asian style, I should say, just so you know, it's like, um, you're not helping us, we're helping you. <laughs> because you're, you're gaining the positive potentials and merits. Um, so to become Buddha, we have to build the two accumulations. The two accumulations are called um, punya or merit or positive qualities and realizations. So that's why even in countries in Asia, which are very poor, the temples are very well funded because um, people are building the accumulations of, of positive qualities. So, um, uh, we do need your help, of course, to keep lights on and, and keep things going. But um, the traditional thing is um, we're here to help you gain the positive accumulations. That makes sense? Different, a little different way of thinking American style is. So, um, you know, thank you again. We'll see, we'll see everybody, some people soon, right? Yeah, thank you. Bye, video land. Yeah. Thank you, Lama. Mm -hmm.